Hello, Bart. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for coming this year to the Natives. You've been one of our prominent speakers. We always like to invite you because you always have a lot of interesting things to tell us about um, medicine and the future of healthcare. So um, how about you share with us, with our audience, um, that what you talked about at the Data Natives this year and your new project? Yeah, and thank you for having me again. So. Um, First of all, I want to say that it's great to see your platform developing. That I, I remember, I think the first contact we had four years ago when you did like your meetup groups here in Austria. Um, and it was like a grassroots movement of uh, getting data scientists together, which now became one of the most important platforms in Europe. I think you did an amazing job doing that. And I want to do a bit similar the same. Like, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I've, I've been working in the health space for 20 years and I've seen a lot of developments and there was no technology that is as transformative as AI, artificial intelligence. It's, gonna, it's going to kind of optimize everything what we see. Um, uh, there was the uh, Institute of Humanity at Oxford that predicted that in 35 years from now, um, even uh, robots will overperform a surgeons. Um, so if you just think about that, um, we have to define today what kind of future we want to build for the next 30 to 40 years. And um, I saw the current trajectory going to um, a very siloed, privatized uh, world, which is embedded with values that are contradictory to our healthcare systems in Europe, which are based on altruism, which are based on openness and collaboration and coordination. And, um, and, and, and now we're getting an an impulse or we are being injected by um, some kind of virus that comes from Silicon Valley which has very different values and that value is based on building monopolies, uh, being, building unicorns um, and I love that in that sense because it creates a lot of innovation but there is one thing that people tend to forget um, that if we do that in healthcare we're going to privatize something that always was a public good and that is knowledge. And Knowledge always has been open. Uh, the foundation for that has been described by Hippocrates. He said, uh, when you take your oath as a doctor, you always have to share your knowledge. You always commit to publish and to open that. But if knowledge is going to be created out of machine learning algorithms, self-learning algorithms, it's going to become privatized. And it's going to be that what makes the one company more competitive as the others. So we have to decide if we're going to transform our healthcare system into a very different culture set or not and I said like I don't want it so I said like um, I'm gonna talk to the government and the, I went even to the European Union uh, on the Commission level and I said we need to do something we need to protect our systems and at the same time advance and lead because only when you lead you can define what the future will be um, and you can shape it but then they didn't understood me um, it was all long and uh, long discussion so I said okay let's do it yourself and then I started an NGO uh, and so I'm going to open source the shit out of it. Um, so I'm going to demonetize, or the goal is to demonetize all knowledge uh, that can be created out of AI and, and making it a public good and make it accessible. So an entrepreneur from Africa can build his own AI company in medicine and not that we have our AIs that are colonizing Africa. So if it becomes something as, uh, as open code for open software, then I think open AI for medical can change a lot and uh, has way better values than everything else what we see now on the market. Yeah, I think definitely the mission and the sentiment is it's very altruistic, as you said, and also something that is, I think, very much in line with how medicine should be perceived. At the same time, I have a couple of questions on that. So first, when it comes to your data that you're donating, is it actually donating it or you're, you are getting paid for submitting your data or how would it work when you say open source AI? Yeah. Can, you, can you explain a little bit? Yeah, definitely, yeah, that's a good question because that's what drives us all. But what do we do with data? Do we monetize it? Uh, there are some concepts that we say like we can earn money with our data. Personally, I don't believe that much in it because for 50 euros, but why should I do all this hassle in that sense? I think it should be uh, uh, in healthcare um, um, has no value in that sense. And it's like donating your organs it would be the same thing that I can start selling my organs. Uh, nobody does that. Uh, you donate your organs because you want to help people. And uh, nobody talks about earning money with donating my kidney. Huh? Um, and, and so it's the same thing and then people start realizing we have to shift so patients can start earning money and I think that's rubbish. So um, I think what we need to do and I talked uh, to a lot of providers, clinical institutes, in Europe you have knowledge is being created out of academia, ac uh, clinical academia, uh, large providers. 
And in, in my role that as a working for a corporate and I talked to them, they never wanted to share the data because the vehicle that I used, which was a corporate, didn't allow themselves to donate their data. But now I have a vehicle which is based on principles of openness. It's an NGO, it's a non-profit. I have very different conversations. They are all willing to work on specific challenges to uh, donate data. For example, let us say we want to solve diagnostics in epileptic care. Huh? Um, in Africa, there's no doctor who can prescribe epilepsy. epilepsy. So let's do 20 data tons uh, uh, during a period of three years and uh, get and use data out of clinical institutes and through these uh, physical events as a data ton, but also a federated data ton online. So we create a community that works on creating algorithms that optimize specific needs in that area. Then people, academical institutes will collaborate on such a project, only defined on such a project. They will donate such thing to the data and we will all work uh, to solve these specific challenges. And the community, which is existing out of medical doctors, data scientists, they all will work for purpose uh, because they know when they do that, uh, they will work for keeping knowledge available for all. And that is exactly the same how healthcare functions in Europe today. It is just a new method, but every clinical researcher does his research and publishes it in a journal. And, and he has his data for him now we have to do this in a collaborative way, and that's uh, what I'm facilitating. With so you're working with other institutions as well and, co and organizations? <laughs> <laughs> always, always, yeah. and we are a firm supporter of collaboration. Uh, but no, I mean, this, this is a big project, basically. It's really bigger than, it's not only a European project, you really want to, global in a globalized sense, connect, yeah. open, wow, very ambitious, and I really like it, and very um, positive in a way, I mean, solving, one of the biggest issues that we have in healthcare. It, it is crazy, Elena. I went to um, uh, to board members being in the industry and kind of know the network and it's so like I proposed them what we wanted to do. Um, I instantly had an LOI sign and said so like, we are going to support. And these are the largest clinical institutes such as the Insel Hospital in, uh, in Switzerland, in Bern, the Akaha in Vienna. Like all these large institutes, they all want to join that movement. and. And I never had something, it's, it's like fire that spreads by itself and I, the, the problem and the challenge that I have will is to put up the organization, to put it into operation and, and mostly the funding because it's an NGO and I, I'm not keen on accepting government money uh, because it's called non-government, NGO, and I don't want to get influenced by any government who tells me I could not um, serve a population in a specific area on this planet because we have a trade war or something. And that could easily happen. Look at uh, Doctors Without Borders. They got money from the European Union and because of the refugee crisis, they had a huge impact. They were told, told what to do and not to do because they got public money. And I, I want to be free on that. Uh, it's, it's because of humanity and not because of our governments we do this. That's a very nice sentiment. Um, one more last question. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, you've been with us for a long time and one of your controversial statements and very um, provocative ones that they grabbed a lot of attention was of course discussing the how the role of the doctor is changing and the AI physician and basically discussing how like we, we need to see taking control of our data and we need to see that in the future things will change and even the physician and the and the patient would their role would change um, and one sentence one sentence that struck with me was from your interview was that in the last 10 years there's 180,000 new applications that have been uh, builds on the in, on on the web and basically like that means 50 per day. So predicting the same thing in the future. What do you see in the future? So okay, so we're talking that we went mobile and now we're talking about open source AI. What could be the next step? Where are we next? I, I love this question <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's, it 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 allows uh, me to talk about uh, the future, which is not always something that people especially in healthcare like because it's a uh, exact science and you first need to prove before you can talk about predictions um, but I think we have to learn looking into the future and today I showed uh, a video uh, where um, I compared building the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona which took 135 years to build and serves a local population uh, for religious purposes um, it probably will take half that time to build and um, a general medical AI that is smarter than all the doctors on this planet 
And, and if we can build it as a collaborative open source way, it will be there for everyone. And it's half of the time of building the Sagrada Familia. So if you put it into relation of thinking forward and thinking big, I think we need to do this in Europe, thinking forward. And I, I, this morning I had a breakfast meeting with politicians and I, I stopped the discussion and said, like, why don't we stop talking, or when do we stop talking about AI as it is something static? It is not static. It is growing exponentially in capacity. So if you discuss AI, you don't discuss what it does today. Um, you discuss what it can do in 30 years, 40 years from now, and then you think about the foundation you build it on. And if you have the wrong foundation, and, and in 30 years you have that system that is wrong and don't, is set on your values, there's no way to correct this. And we have seen this in some kind of media platform, social media, where a lot of people are regretting what happened and they're trying to correct this and it's really hard to correct these things. So in healthcare, I think if we do it wrong, some things can go wrong and, and, ex and exclusivity perhaps could enter our European healthcare systems, which were always based on inclusivity. And I think we have to really kind of design the future, which is desirable for our future generations and it embeds all our values and then decide on which foundation we built it on. Excellent. A perfect comment. Thank you so much. Okay, I, so I want to I leave it with that. Thank yeah. you.